All right, y'all, let's, uh, let's get rocking. Everybody have a good break? Who? Or just a break. It was a break. Um, okay, here, let me make a, a, a couple of announcements. Hang on. So first off, um, the third quiz is you can take it a week from Thursday at the end of class so make sure you, you, know, you have enough time because we won't start the quiz we'll start the quiz probably around 5.30 or so so make sure you have until about 6.30 um, if you want to take it then if you don't you take it the following Sunday I think it's at noon or at 1.00 I got to make sure I know what time we have the room for. I'll and I'll make sure. It's a couple different times, but it, it won't matter. We'll work it out. Um, I'll f I'll fill you in for sure. Okay, you can take it either day. It doesn't matter. It's the same format as before. All the readings are up. Um, okay. Let me just say this. Yo, hang on. We're starting. So we have three more TA interview sessions um, for next semester if you want to be a TA. It's actually going to be an easier position next semester because you won't be doing any grading as TAs. So um, they're tonight, Wednesday, and Thursday from 7 to 8. And the way to do it is to just jump online really quick and just, if you, if you want to do it, it's, it's really, we, we have, there are about nine more spaces open and we really want to fill them. Nine spaces to audition and if you can go tonight from seven to eight see me right after class okay so um yeah we want to fill those positions okay secondly um there is an opportunity if you're an international student we have a course that's available through world in conversation it's a really cool experience you have to be an international student but according to penn state standards and you can be from anywhere but um, and to get information on this, go to worldinconversation.org backslash DAC, and we will, it'll be running through the, the class slideshow. It's really an awesome educational experience. It really, honestly, in my humble opinion, um, it's one of the best, I think, one of the best experiences that students can have at Penn State joining this particular class right here. So it's three credits. Um, and I have to say it's actually not that difficult, but I don't want to say that too loudly, but I'll say it under my breath. So no quizzes, no readings. Um, okay, cool. Um, you can, and I have flyers up here, by the way, after class. So if you want a flyer on that, see me. All right. So um, I want to, what we're going to do today is talk, I want to talk a little bit about D discrimination and bias and then just some things that really we we don't necessarily look at and maybe a little bit about why we don't look at them and next class I want to go in a, a very different direction and talk about Muslims and Islam and Islamophobia as it's often called um, on Thursday and then next Tuesday I'm not sure what we'll do I'll just wait and see what happens um, but uh, what I want to say about discrimination and implicit bias, and hey, by the way, it's really, today's, I feel really chilled today. I had a really good break. I was actually in the Philippines over the break, and it was like a really chill experience, and I feel really relaxed. And so we're going to be relaxed today. One of the things that's important to keep in mind that I want to emphasize, especially to anyone who's watching the stream, is we see discrimination and we see bias and implicit bias everywhere. It's not, and I know a lot of times people in the United States 
um, if those of us here who want to be critical of the United States um, often want to make or I hear people making kind of grandiose statements or big statements about how it's it's worse in the United States it's you know it's the most racist country in the world or or it's it hasn't gone away it hasn't gotten any better it hasn't this it hasn't that or it um, and I, and I want to just take kind of a sober analysis of that because things have gotten much, much better in the U.S. by way of racism, discrimination, and bias. I mean, that, it's just, it's not even a question. Things have changed dramatically in the United States. That's the first point. The second point is we see this everywhere in the world. Anywhere where you have groups based on anything, some groups will sort of maintain or grasp on to the kind of dominant way of seeing the world or driving the culture or leading the culture, however it is, and create conditions by which people in their particular subgroup or subcategory um, find reasons and validation and justification for being discriminatory toward other groups, whoever it is that they've identified. doesn't matter. We see it everywhere in the world. We've seen it throughout history that somehow that some groups will just pick other groups out to dominate. And then what you have to do is you've got to create a story about those groups, that they are less than you, that somehow they, they deserve it, that somehow they brought it on themselves, that somehow, you know, if you aren't discriminatory toward them, you, you will be at risk as, of your own sort of cultural or group annihilation. I mean, something like that. Um, and that is... Uh, just a, that's a global story. We just see that everywhere I've ever, I just saw it last week in talking to people in, in where I was in the Philippines and, you know, talking to people, okay, who's the group on the bottom and who's on top and, you know, how's it operate and how's it work and what's going on and who benefits and who doesn't benefit. And so that's the, the first thing I want to say um, about this. Um, but I also want to talk a little bit about, and then we're going to, this is going to be a cool class, by the way, for me anyway. So, so here's what I want to do. Can you, um, like, can people in the back just don't look at the screen, okay? We're, we're going to go from here. So just whatever, the back half of the room, just don't look at the screen. And people at the front look at the screen and just take a look at that image. We're not, we're not, we're not necessarily doing that. I see people in the back looking at the screen like WTF. Right. So people in the front, look at the screen. Okay, see that? Really take a look at the face. See what you're looking at. And people in the back. Okay, so now close. Don't look at the screen. And people in the back, you don't look at the screen. And okay, you got it? Everyone in the back? So take a look at that face. Like really memorize it. See where it's at. Okay, so now everybody. Um, now imagine you got to pick out the face. You gotta, you gotta go through here and decide which one is the face that you saw. And, you know, who, who was it? So people in the, and what we're gonna find, if we actually did this officially, like, because we're not literally doing it, because I'm just kind of demonstrating how this would operate. What we're gonna find is that if you are a person who saw this image, then you're going to see, you're gonna tend to identify one of these people down here. And if you are a person who saw this image, then you're going to tend to identify, say, you're more, like, much more likely to think or to say or report, hey, it was one of these people down here. Meaning that in this very kind of, this non-conscious way, and this is what we talk about implicit bias, right? This non-conscious way. We're not aware of it. We're not thinking about it. But we see it everywhere we turn in this non-conscious way that people are going to associate educated with light skin and ignorant with dark skin. And we could do this and have done it with things, you know, like educated or violent and non-violent or whatever the case is. But the fact is, you know, that, that image is right here in the center, so everybody sees the exact same image because if you notice, watch, it's the same image as the one in the center. And that's what we see. But just associating that one word, that one tiny word, takes it out of context and moves our analysis somewhere else. And it's, it's not conscious. It's implicit. It's inside of us. Like we're not aware of it. And 
what we see in the world of trying to understand discrimination and trying to understand racism is this kind of implicit bias is in operation everywhere in the world. It's always going on. So everybody suffers from it. You know, in the, the, the groups on top, the groups on the bottom, everybody suffers from it. Certainly groups on the bottom are more likely to be damaged by it in some way. And so that's big. Nobody gets away from that. So like when, if anyone ever asks you, are you biased or are you racist or are you prejudiced? The answer should be absolutely because we absolutely are. Everybody is because it's part of and parcel of being alive that we're living. You know, we take in the ideas of our culture and we live with them and they're part of us and we don't get we can't get rid of them. OK, so here I showed you this before. I think, right, I just showed you once when we did the race switching, right? Remember that? But I only showed it once. Am I right, bro? Okay, so listen. So just think about this, right? This is, this is really big. And I, I want to emphasize to you that people say, I hear people say there is no longer discrimination. You're like, it doesn't exist. It's not that we, look, it doesn't exist the way that it was but it absolutely exists. And the, you can never say like, oh, I rented an apartment, I tried to rent an apartment and they wouldn't rent it to me, but this other guy went in right after me and they rented to him. And so therefore, that's racism because I'm black or I'm brown or something. But no, it's not. It's because you don't know what happened in the meantime. They might have gotten a phone call. Any number of things might happen. The only way to absolutely identify whether something is or is not racist or biased or something is to control for all of the variables that we can possibly control for and then isolate the factor that we're really looking at. So in this particular case, you know, we take two testers and we take you know, in this particular study, it was a, and you know, it's kind of, you take a, they took a white guy and a black guy, and they were exactly the same. They dressed the same, they walked the same, they talked the same, they shook hands the same, everything was exactly the same. And they went, they gave them resumes, and they each had the exact same resume, and they would go on in for a job, and they would apply for the job and they talked alike, everything, their intonation, they were the same height, the same haircuts, the same teeth, everything. They either wore glasses or they didn't wear glasses. So the only thing that was different was the color of their skin. And so they wanted to say, hey, who's, gonna, who's more likely to get called back for this job? Is it gonna be this white guy or the black brown guy? Cause, cause it's gonna be one or the other. Like, who's more likely to? And in a world that was absolutely fair and in which there was no discrimination, it would be equal. There would be no differences. And so what they did was they added in this other little interesting piece to it and they, they alternated having a felony drug conviction. So you, you might remember this, but I wanna bring it back. So they alternated having a felony drug conviction. So sometimes it was the white guy with the felony drug conviction on his resume. And sometimes it was the black guy with a felony drug conviction on his resume. And then they just, so we know that the most highly valued or the person most likely to get the, the great, the callbacks, the greatest number of callbacks are going to go to the white guy without a felony conviction, because that guy is going, because we know there's all, there's gonna be some degree of discrimination, right? I mean, in the world of sociology, we know that. If you're in denial about it, thinking that the world's fair and the world's even and equal and people hire the best person for the job and so on and so forth, well, it, obviously that's not the case because everywhere where we do these kinds of studies where we control for everything, people are not hiring the best person for the job. People are engaging in bias. They're victims of their own bias. They're stereotyping. There's prejudice. There's maybe outright discrimination, although most of it is not outright. Most of it is like really hidden that most people don't even know that it's happening. But we know that the white guy without a, com a criminal record is the most desirable. So the question was, who's the second most desirable? Is it gonna be the black guy without a criminal record, which we imagine, of course, would be the case? Or is it gonna be the white guy with a criminal record? 
So most of us would say, well, definitely, it's most certainly, even black people would say, unless you really, I just want, but most people have some sense of fairness. And you're going to think like, well, clearly, it should be the black guy without a criminal record. And, you know, certainly if you ask most white people, they're going to say like, well, absolutely, it's going to be the black guy without a criminal record. But in fact, what it is, it's the white guy. This is percent callbacks. So percentage of all the white guys without a criminal record who are part of this, 34% of them got called back. 17% of all the white guys who did this with a criminal record got called back. 14% of the black guys with out a criminal record got called back. So this is really Dude. Can you can you be my my guy first? No. Bro, can No, I, you just stand up real fast. You're right here. Listen. Can you just stand here? Look, man. What's your name again, bro? Charles. Charles? Yeah. Dude, look. Here's Charles. Charles is your classmate. Charles is working really hard to make his... Are you working hard, bro? Yeah. Charles is working really hard to make his way through Penn State. What Charles wants is an equal shot. Charles wants to know that when he hands the resume in his resume in, and he goes for an interview, and I go for an interview, he wants to know that they're going to treat him the same way as me. But Charles already knows, you already know that they're not going to treat you. Some, some people will, but most, but you're, you're not going to be treated the same way. Am I right on that? That's, okay, so listen. But here's the deal. It's actually so much more problematic. Look at these numbers. First off, 34. If he and I are exactly the same, the white guy and Sam and Charles, if we literally are exactly the same, if you, any white men out there, especially white men who think that you're not going to get the job because of affirmative action, when let me remind you that only about 45% of all jobs out there, 10% are linked to some kind of affirmative action program anyway. And most of them benefit women and have nothing to do with you. You're probably not going to get hurt. In these jobs, we're linked to affirmative action. So it's just not, it's not a problem. So all of you who think like, oh my God, I'm going to get hurt. I'm going to get hammered. I'm going to be left behind because of all these affirmative action programs that are going to black people and brown people. Look. The data are showing that, that that's really not the case, that you have, you have an immense advantage over Charles. Look right here, 34% versus 14%. If Charles is equal to you in every way, he's as smart as you, he dresses as well as you, he talks as well as you, he makes eye contact as well as you, everybody, everything down the line. You still have basically a 20-point advantage over him. Like, that, man, it's good to be white. Like, you get that, right? Like, it's good. To, it, like, really, really is a benefit. And then you look, you look at this, this, these numbers. You could even have a felony drug conviction, which by my mind, by the way, shouldn't bar anybody from having a job. But that's neither here nor there. I'm in the minority, probably. But, to, so look. When you, when you think about it, like when I look at you and I'm thinking, I mean, you're my student, right? And you work hard. You work just as hard as everybody else. But I'm walking through this world and I'm looking at you compared to white men out there. And I know that you ha are a couple steps back. And then if he, hang on one sec. Hold that for a second. And then if Charles dares to talk about it, like if you dare to bring this up and dare to put it out into the room and dare to have the conversation, then you become the black guy who's complaining. The black guy who's like, come on, man, that's not happening anymore. That's not like, come on, get a life. Get a... Whereas when I'm looking at the 20-point advantage, that's, that's just an... That, 
Bro, can, can you come here a second? What's your name again? Max. Max. Dude, dude, just look, Max right here. Max has got a 20-point advantage if they're exactly equal. In my class, there's no advantage or disadvantage because you all are in the class, right? You're just doing your thing and whatever. But dude, you have a 20-point advantage over this dude if he's equal to you in every way. Like, come on, man. That is just so ungraciously unfair. And then when Max and I are sitting around having a beer, you know, and we're talking like, oh, shit, dude, yeah, I hope I get a job because, you know, all this affirmative action stuff. And like, it's like, come on, man. That's just... Uh, so I think for me, what I would say, dude, do you have anything you want to say? How do you feel about that? Look at, I mean, how do you feel about that? And according to this, dude, study after study, this isn't just one. I mean, I could pull up endless amounts of studies that are going to show this. How do you feel about the fact that he's, got, then in this study in particular, he's got a 20-point advantage over you. I mean, do you have any thoughts? Do you just want to say anything? Do you want to? You don't have to. Well, I, <laughs> I knew all this information before. Like, I know I'm personally at a disadvantage in most situations. But, like, I know as over time, it's getting easier and easier compared yeah, to what yeah. it used to be. So I know at least over time, it will eventually come easier. And I just know as long as I work hard, I should be able to achieve the goals that I want to achieve. Yeah, you will. I mean... Yeah, and if you don't achieve those goals, you'll achieve other goals. Yeah. Because the goals you want to achieve now, by the way, are not the goals you're going to have in 10 years. So, And, bro, how do you feel about the fact that, look at your classmate right here, man. The, like, you have, just because you're the white guy. Max um, the cracker. <laughs> how do you feel um, about that? What's that like? I, I think it's really unfortunate. Like, I don't think that just because someone is born different, they deserve to get treated differently, obviously. But how do like, you... I'm not, okay, I'm not doing ahead. anything differently than he is. And just because just I look different, I have a... I just... I don't know. That seems weird to me. Do you, f do you feel guilty about it? Not really. Because it's like... It's not my fault. But okay. it's just... I don't know. Dude. Hang on. Do you want him to feel guilty about it, dude? No. Like... It's all just how society was brought upon us. It's not like we, we're the ones who created society since we're so, like, just coming into, like, adulthood, like, trying to get, become in charge of society. So it's all the past that has brought this upon us. So it's just our job to try to, like, change it to make it more, like, equal for everyone. Dude, cool, man. Bro. I, I'm, so I'm really happy you say you don't feel guilty because you shouldn't feel guilty. And, and, and by the way... White people or anyone who's not black or brown or what? No, let me just talk to white people. I rarely in my life have met, I don't think I ever have actually met somebody of color who thinks white people should feel guilty and want white people to feel guilty. But one of the ways in which white people, we don't, when I say to you, how do you feel about that? There's no way for you to respond. Like, there's nothing you can say. Like, how do I feel about the fact that part of the reason I'm able to stand here and be as successful as I am at what I do is because I'm white? How do I feel about that? Ah, fuck, I don't know. I don't, let me, hang on a second, man. I'll just roll up another bone and see if I can come. So I have nothing to say. I have nothing to say. I don't know. So, yeah, like, whatever. But the key... My white friends, especially if any of the, these really, the folks are watching the stream who think I hate white people, but I've never met a black person who wants anyone to feel guilty, ever. It's not the story, but we, as a way to make sense of, our, of these advantages, we impose that vision on people of color, on people of minority status, so that somehow we can feel okay. It's like, oh, y'all just want us to feel guilty. Well, fuck you. Like, get lost. Like, no, nah, like, you know, like, I don't feel guilty. I don't think like, that's not what anyone's asking. What anyone's asking, like what Charles just said is, I mean, dude, what do you want white people? Hang on one second. I'm going to come back to you. What do you, 
What do you think he wants white people to do? Here, you can hold that. What do you think Charles would want you to say about what you should do about your privilege? Um, I feel like they just want, they would want white people to just treat them like they would anybody else. Just don't, I mean. It, no, it's cool. Just, Go ahead, dude. You're doing well. I don't know. Just don't act as if it's like that important that they're black. Just treat them like that you're anybody else. Yeah. Okay. That's cool, dude. I like that. What, what would you say? What do you want white people? What would you want them to say? Or what do you want them to, to do? Just pretty much treat, treat, like if people are equal in every other standard but skin color, just like look at them and say they're both equal. Don't be saying like, even though people subconsciously probably has a little bit of bias, try to eliminate that bias because that's the only way it will be able to be changed. Yeah, just be, be aware of it. Yeah, I like it. Just be aware. Try to be aware. So you can. I have bias. Damn, I'm trying to. I'm working on it all the time. That's fair. Dude. All right, dude. Thanks, Mom. Thanks, Don. All right. Okay, so. Let me, let me go to it. Let me show you a couple other things here. Look at this one. So these are really serious, by the way. When we hand in, these people sent out 5,000 resumes. And they're all exactly the same except names, and these are clearly white, tend to be white names, and these clearly tend not to be. And like, this is serious, right? This is not just like, hey, you know, we, we've sort of gone beyond this. This is, this is everywhere around us. This is today. And so look at this. Let me show you some other ways in which it's really deeply built in. Right, so here's incarceration rates in the U.S., black youth. These are all youth, right? So look at 433 out of 100,000. Juvenile incarceration rates, right? Which says like, wow. Okay, so now you could have this idea that I want to help you understand how to think about these things. Is anyone, is anyone right now thinking, yeah, okay, but, you know, the problem is, we don't really know what these numbers mean because black youth might commit more crimes and they may be more violent and they might do more things or, you know, whatever it might be, right, than say Asian youth or white youth or Hispanic youth, et cetera, right? Okay, so what we do then is we start comparing apples to apples and apples to orange and to oranges to oranges and so on, right? Because you have to compare people along on the same criteria. And so then we start doing this. The Justice Institute said, well, what if we compare juveniles who've done the same crimes and who have the same backgrounds and who have the same histories and who have shown up in front of the judges the same number of times. And let's then see what happens, how often they get transferred to the adult system. And so Divine told us, you, with his story, told us about how essential this is early in the semester because when you get transferred up to the adult system, that's a whole different ball, a ball game that you're going to play with. And so even when they commit the same crimes, even when they have the same backgrounds, similar backgrounds, we see black youth differently than we see white youth. So look, much more likely are Latinos, Asians, more likely to be treated in a harsher way. And so this is discrimination that's built into the system because people are not willing or have been unwilling or not capable of seeing these really looking deeply at the structures of, of inequality. And this is part of what this class is, man. It's just like be aware of it. Think about it. And so look at this, illegal drug use. So white people, this is just whites and blacks, but white people as the percentage of drug users, about 70%. And versus black people, it's about 12%, right? So this is roughly the same with users and dealers and so on. It doesn't really matter. But then look at incarceration rates. Look at what happens. Suddenly, incarceration rates for drugs for black people go way up. Like, why is that? How is that? Like, this is the stuff that we're talking about all the time. Male and car look at this. So if you go back here, and if I think to... Divine, if I think about your story and what happened with you and the kind of decisions you made and didn't make it and so on. And then I look at all this here and I look at the, the ways in which black youth are treated differently here and Latino youth and Asian youth. And then I look at this and I say, well, of course, of course, 
you're going to see these distinctions. All right, Mom. So I want to go in a slightly uh, different direction. So you, you got that, right? I, I, can't, I can't just show you, before I go in this direction, I want to say I can't just go on and on and on with data because it doesn't matter. What, what matters is to be aware that, yes, there are differences in the way people experience the world. Sometimes when people start talking about this stuff, they're drawing on information and they're drawing on data that maybe not all of us see. And that's all we can do in a class on race relations in the United States is look at that, okay? But what we're going to do is go in a different direction and I want to have a conversation about something. And I need a couple of volunteers who ideally I need, no, I need African-American ideally volunteers, okay? And I need volunteers who know something about this. Did you know? Did, who, knows, who, who knows about this, about this guy? Wait, how, how many total people know about this guy, about what happened? Dude, do you, bro, do you have an opinion on it? Have you been up here before? All right, dude, come on up. You, and I need, are you African-American or African? Are you African-American, bro? What are, where, where are you from? Uh, damn, are you buddy, but were you born here? All right, that's good enough, man. Yeah, plus you weren't Tommy Hilfinger, man, so you're good. Yeah, have a seat up there. All right, I need, one, I need another person. Ideally, a, a woman. Ideally, I need African, someone who's African American who has who knows something about this. Who's got it? Who wants to do it? Dude, you can have a seat there. Dude, you got it. All right, man. Oh man. Yo, what's your name? Ali. Ali? Yes, sir. What's your name? Alicia. Alicia. Yes. Alicia. Ali. Say hello to the class. How y'all doing? Yeah. Good. You're killing it, man. <laughs> Dude, respond to them. How you doing? They're sleeping. It's after the break. You know what I mean? Same thing you were doing about 10 minutes ago before I called on you. Alicia? Yes. Where are you from? I'm from Newberry Park, California. Oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. And bro, your your family's from Sudan? Yes, sir. South Sudan? No, no North, no, North yeah, Sudan? No, okay, yeah, exactly. Ali. I should have known by your name. Got it. Okay, so here's the deal. So you haven't anyone else want to come up? Are we good? Okay, ma'am. Um, so tell us what you know. What do you know? Uh, I heard that um he's go used, talk right into the mic. Uh, I heard that he used the N word during a conference call with um other manager other business managers. Yep. And I believe it caused a controversy because um like they respect him. He was a big idol, he's a big image, he's someone that um that he everyone knows about, Papa John. Like you buy stuff there every week. If, Dude, like Tommy Hilfinger. Yeah, man. exactly. <laughs> exactly. So when they heard him say that it kinda like ruined his reputation, it kinda ruined like the company itself. So it kinda hurt. Kinda hurt. Okay, got it. Alicia, how about you? What do you got? Yeah, same thing as him. I just heard that he had like said the said the N word during a conference call, and it was like a pretty big controversy. Okay, what else? Do you have anything else though? He dropped the N bomb in a conference call. Yeah. I guess the nature of like his the fact that he isn't of African American descent is what really caused the controversy. And nowadays, like anything, anything racial causes an uproar, anything. Are you there on that? Um, do, I mean, do you have any more details? Like, do I don't know. I just heard like that afterward he said something like, black people know I'm not racist or something stupid like that. Uh-huh. Uh, but yeah, that's really all I know. 
Anyone, can anyone add anything? Are we good to go? Is that good enough? We can start here? Yeah, it's good enough. All right. Okay, so here. Um, So I woke up to this, right? I guess it was last summer or whenever this came down, right? Right. So I wake up and I I don't know. I don't eat Papa John's. I, I really, I don't know this guy. I don't, he's just some dude. I didn't know who he was. Just, I thought his name, he was John. His name's John, right? So it's, yeah, John. Schnatter, right? I didn't know that until this, but I woke up to that and I see it like, oh my God, Papa John's founder dropped the N bomb on a conference call. Okay? And I'm thinking, oh my God, so what do you think he said? I mean, do you have any idea what he said? I have no idea. I don't want to know, to be honest with you. You don't want to know? I don't want to know. What do you think he said? I have no clue. I, I, I literally don't know. <laughs> I mean, when it comes to like us, like us as like millennials, like when we're talking to our friends, it might come out curse words or words like the N word. But like he's an adult, you know, he knows what he's saying. He knows like it's as a na- the nature of an adult. You're supposed to think. Talk right in the mic, dude. Uh, the nature of an adult. You're supposed to think before you speak. So like in his circumstance, that shouldn't have happened. Like he should have knew. He should have knew to think. OK. Do you have anything to add to that? What do you I, think happened? I have no clue what happened. I don't understand how like the N word comes up in a conference call. It seems like a very like businessy setting for that word to even come into play. So I don't know. Okay. All right. So are we ready? So here, the guy last year, the revenues at Papa John's Pizza were one point eight billion dollars. This is like a, this is a serious company here, right. right? I mean, they're selling pizza, so I don't know how serious we can be. But Tommy Hilfiger is just selling clothes. I don't know how serious that can be. So, okay, so the, but this is a big company. So this is a big deal. And this is out in the world in this huge way. So I'm thinking, oh, my God, like, what happened? So, but I know the facts matter because I so often find myself getting called out on things as I do every, almost every single day after every class because a lot of people watch the live stream and, they're all, and there are a lot of people with lots of different opinions and lots of people who are much smarter than I am about any single issue. And so if I say something about, let's say, implicit bias and I just talk a little bit about, well, there might be somebody out there who actually studies implicit bias, who's been reading a lot about it, and, I, and I'm very much this generalist guy, so I have to know really a little bit about lots of things, but just enough to not be, be more of an idiot than I am, right? right? So in this particular case, I'm saying I know that, whoa, what happened? Because there must be some, st- I want to know what the story is, because this would be really good to use in class. And so, and I don't know this guy. So I'm like, I don't give a damn about Papa John's. Papa John's could go away for, I mean, it's irrelevant to me, right? Okay, so, so I find out, so I, so I start reading stuff. So I'm going to walk you through the story, right? So he's on this conference call and he's working with the, Hang on a second. See how loud it gets down here? And motherfuckers are out there talking like that. <laughs> it's like just this din. You know what I mean? See how distracting it is? Yeah. All right. Damn. All right. So I'm just going to whisper so everybody has to be really quiet to hear me. All right. So listen, man. So he's on a call with this PR service. It's called the la- this PR company called the Laundry Service. So they're like this new, I think it's a New York based company. And they're doing this PR, they're getting ready for this PR campaign. And it happened, this was May 22nd, right? So he participates in this conference call, he and some other people, up, up big, upper big wigs at Papa John's. And during um, the call, the laundry service is trying to get him to use Kanye West as the Papa John spokesperson because Kanye is Kanye. And this dude <laughs> says, this dude says, I'm not using Kanye because he's vulgar and he drops the N bomb. Like, I don't want to use this guy, right? So, like, no. And they're pushing him. Like, no, you really need Kanye because you got all this NFL controversy stuff. So, oh, do you know about the NFL controversy? What's that? Uh, 
the fact that all the players are kneeling for uh, pretty much Yeah, but social do you know what his take on it was? Uh, Kanye's? No. John. No. no. Do you know? Okay, so let me tell you. So the issue is, um, so they are asking him, but uh, are you racist, right? And he's like, no, I'm not racist. They're like, yeah, but what's with the NFL controversy? And so then they talk about the NFL controversy. And what's the NFL controversy? Here, let me walk you through this. So this guy, John, says, well, when all the players... So Papa John's is the pizza of the NFL. I don't know what that means, but the official pizza sponsor of the NFL, okay? So this dude says, when the NFL players are kneeling, he's saying they need to address this situation. And why do they need to... The NFL needs to address this. They need to nip it in the bud. Right? And they need to address it and they need to get it off the table. Why? Because it's hurting the NFL and it's hurting all of the companies that are sponsors of the NFL. Right? So, so here, this is one thing, right? Last year, this is what he says. Last year, the ratings for the NFL went backwards because of the elections. And this year, the ratings are going backwards even more because of the controversy. And so the controversy is polarizing the customer, meaning our customers at Papa John's, polarizing the country, and I want to put focus back on our people and pizza, right? Because focus should be on pizza, of course, right? All right, why? Because he's the CEO of a pizza company, and that's his job. Put the focus back on pizza. I might not think it's very important, but I want to put the focus back on Social 119 because that's what I do for a living. So I'm not really, I don't care about the other class. I care about this class. So that's what he's saying. So he said that he expected the earnings decline for Papa John's to persist until a solution is put in place by the NFL for its players' protests. So he's a pizza CEO. He's saying this is hurting the bottom line and you got to fix this. You got to NFL, you need to deal with this issue. Any thoughts on that? I don't I don't see how uh the pizza company has anything to do with like the social issues that are going on in the NFL. Like I do get that their sponsorships, but like usually like companies such as big companies who try to avoid being in that controversy, they try to stay away from that. So him bringing that all up didn't really make sense to me. Well, Okay. All right. So, so he already stepped in the, he already stepped in quicksand in a way when he could have just backed off and been like, shit in the private moments. Do you have a thought on it? Um, not really. Once again, I do feel like pizza companies shouldn't be responsible, but if it is affecting the bottom line, then it is something that, you know, they have to talk about. If it affects the bottom yeah, line, like right? If it affects how much thing. money they're going to make, of course they have to discuss okay, it. Okay, and so you're going to be careful about whether you step into, you weigh into something. But the bottom, that's his job, is to say, look, man, I have shareholders, I have, P, I have franchises, I have employees, I have all the stock, I have everything. I have an allegiance to this company, and you all need to fix this because whatever. If I was a car company, it'd be the same thing. If I, Tommy Hilfinger was the clo the official clothing whatever, of the NFL, all the players wore Tommy Hilfinger, then one would expect that Tommy Hilfinger would have an idea about the NFL dealing with this damn controversy. Like, can you address this with your players and fix it and whatever, and let's move on because it's hurting our clothing sales. I could see, like, for instance, a clothing company doing that because, you know, they're involved, mainly involved, like, the jersey sales, like Nike. If someone were, like, and Nike saying that. Well, I let's assume that. they're not. Let's assume it's just like all the players wanting to be cool in their Tommy Hilfiger, <laughs> yeah. right? But if it was Nike or right. something, that may be different. I could see that. I could see um, like uh, the CEO talking about okay. like this hurting the company. But pizza. Yep. All on. right. Okay. So let's keep going. All right. So we got it. So, but in in any event, like yeah, I don't know. So he weighs into this. The the. By the way, if you're not if you're not if if you're not from the U.S. If you're watching the stream and not for the news, here's what happened. And those of you in the room who have no idea what happened. So, and Jared talked about this a little bit earlier in the semester. So a year and a half ago, some of the players just decided, or a couple of years ago now, just decided with all of the police violence 
against black and brown people during the national anthem, some of the black and brown players, black players in particular, and some of the white players decided that instead of standing during the national anthem, they were going to take a knee just as a kind of a protest to say, look, we respectfully want to say that this country needs to deal with its violent racism problem. So this is a big issue because lives are on the line, lives are at stake. If you go back to my slides, all of the stuff of mass incarceration, which more likely affects black people and brown people than white people, all of this, the violence, everything, one piece after another. The player said, we actually have a platform right here and we're just going to take a knee. And then the whole world's going to look at us and then the whole world's going to have to have a conversation about why it is that we're taking a knee. And that's what we want. Start talking about this police violence stuff and stop trying to sweep it under the rug. So this guy comes along and says, okay, that's fine, but we have profits, we have other things to deal with. NFL, not players, he didn't tell the players to start standing up. He said, NFL, talk to your players, deal with your players and figure this thing out and work it out and let's come to a solution, okay? Okay, so now the next thing in the conference call is this. So then he says, uh, well, let me go back. So he says something on the order of Colonel Sanders. So they're saying, are you racist? So let's talk about this. Papa John's, da, 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 what is it? How are we doing? And he says, well, Colonel Sanders... Kentucky Fried Chicken, right? Got that dude? He says he used the N-word regularly, and but I would never do that. But he didn't say the N-word. He said Colonel Sanders actually used to say, and see, now I'm not even going to say it, because, <laughs> and I'm going to explain why I'm not even going to say it in about 60 seconds. So Colonel Sanders, he's in the conference call, right? And he's, they're like, are you racist? He's like, no. And like, I'm not going to have Kanye West, and it doesn't matter. Colonel Sanders used to say, eh, N-bomb, and he got away with it all the time. But I'm not, and we're not. Like, we're not doing that, okay? Okay, now got it? Here it is. So founder John Schnatter allegedly used the N-word on a conference call. So he didn't say, he's never been accused of saying, so-and-so is an N-bomb, this and this, N-bomb that. What he said was, look, in the context of this conversation about race issues and Kanye West and this, that, he's like, Colonel Sanders used to say N-bomb, but at Papa John's, we're not, we don't do that. Okay? Yeah. Now, that's the URL for an article. That's the URL. See it? See that word? Allegedly right there? You got it? Here's the article. Papa John's founder used N-word on a conference call. That's what I woke up with. And I thought, holy shit. If Papa John, John Schnatter, the Papa, the big Papa of Papa John's Pizza, uses the N-word by talking about how Colonel Sanders, what Colonel Sanders said, I, Sam Richards, could get fired by talking, by saying what Papa John said. If I drop the N-bomb in here, even though I'm reading from a script of like, well, they said Papa John said, I can't even say it. I, I, if he could get fired, he's the CEO of a $1.8 billion pizza company. I'm just a knucklehead sitting here at Penn State University. So if he can get fired, I can see the same thing. Pro Penn State professor dropped the N-bomb in his class. Even though I'm like, motherfuckers, I'm just reading what this guy did. You know what I mean? But like, oh no, 
Because the whole world is going to be like, oh my God, I knew that Sam Richards guy one day. All these former students, whoever it is, oh, I knew one day he was going to cross the line. Yep, he dropped the M-bomb. I wonder who he called him. I bet it was some student who he didn't like. I bet someone really pissed him off and he just like went after him and called him an N-bomb. Like, yeah, it was probably it. Who knows? I have no idea. No, man, I'm just reading something right here. Like, oh, I get it, right? So that's the context. Meanwhile, when I go around the world, if I, anybody I ask, how did he drop the N-bomb? It's like, we all, well, this is what we see, he dropped the N-bomb. I don't know what he said, but like, well, whatever, right? So the question becomes, do you have any thoughts on that? What are your thoughts on that? I think um, the, like, the title of the article, it's, it's for controversy. Like, like, they knew what they were doing. They knew... They probably had the inside scoop of what Dude, was Dude, it's not on. just one article. It's like yeah. thousands of Many articles. Many of them probably out. had the same thing. They had the same information they got, and they realized that controversy brings money. And if, if someone reads something sort of like that, they're going to want to read that newspaper. They're going to want to buy that newspaper. Okay. So that's why I believe that's why they use that, the way they use it, the dictionary. All right. What do you think about the fact that this guy got fired for saying the N-bomb by talking about what Colonel Sanders said, Colonel Sanders, you regularly used the N-bomb, and he was okay. I think that it is extremely unfortunate that he got fired, and he shouldn't have been fired for, like, saying it in that context. I'm not trying to get you to say oh, that, because no, no, I no, don't no, know. No. Like, I, I, I have more I want to yeah. say about no, this. No, no, so. no, that's... That's what I think. I'm not defending this guy because no, I, I, I have no idea, right? Yeah, no, I, I don't think he should have, like, I don't think he should have been fired or lost his company for saying the N-word in that context, and it's unfortunate. But, like, I was, I was like, thinking myself in that, like, me being a black woman in that situation, like, I hardly use the N-word myself, so... I hardly hardly use it. Hardly. This might like, be the only time this brother ever used <laughs> yeah. it, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, I like hardly ever use the word myself. So, like, I don't know if, like, I would have used it in that context, but Dude, I feel bad Ali, for him. Ali, man from Sudan, how often do you drop the M-bomb? I'm not going to lie to you. Go, don't lie. <laughs> Hang on. Talk, say it in the microphone, my friend. Every day. Every day. <laughs> uh-huh. Unfortunately. Good thing you don't own a pizza company. Yeah. <laughs> don't ever think about owning no, a pizza I'm company. Sure. Got you, man. Now it's on film, so you like you got it. It's all good. <laughs> so listen, man. Um, but here's the thing. Here's with Papa John's, right? So now we start putting pieces together. Okay, so the NFL thing, he, back in the day, he gave money to the Trump campaign, $5,000. Not a lot, I don't think, but he gave money to the Trump campaign. Oh, now you got the, you got the, the, you got the story in mind, right? Oh, so he's a racist, because, you know, Trump, anyone who gives money to the Trump campaign is a racist, and so now we keep going on and on. But there's one other piece here about this guy, right? And this is where the story gets complicated. So everyone who thinks, if you're thinking this guy completely got shafted by the fact that, damn, that's all he did? I have dropped the M-bomb in this classroom reading, reading something that's up on the screen. Like somebody sent a tweet in from outside the class and so in my TA before Jeff put it up on the screen to say, and, and the tweet was dropping the M-bomb, and I read the tweet, and then I, oh my God, I actually said the word, eh, and like, shit, if someone finds that video, I could get fired. Well, now they have this video, because I'm admitting that I actually said the word <laughs> in my class. It's like, it could be the end of me, right? This is really dangerous territory we're in, right? Okay, so here's the thing. So another piece of this guy says, well, he also, in the same call, was talking about when he was a kid growing up, about how white people, because it was this racist Indiana town, white people be used to punish black people by dragging them on the back of their pickup trucks. I don't know how often it happened, but he told the story. Like, that's pretty effed up. And he told it, you know, that's effed up, right? And so, but the issue was, apparently... 
the people in the room felt like he said it in a very insensitive way. He just like told the story. Oh yeah, when I was a kid, black people used to get dragged in the back of pickup trucks by racist white people as a way to punish them and without sensitivity. So clearly this guy is just needed needs or needed some sensitivity training when you walk into saying something like that you don't walk into it like saying like yeah man at papa john's we used to sell coke and now we've flipped over to pepsi because that's just how it is like oh when i was a kid so it's not like this comes out of nowhere okay so here but here's the thing so here's an article by this person. Papa John CEO finally learned the lesson the media exercise was trying to teach because it was a media exercise and he was going through. Racism is bad for business. And I'm like, is he racist? Well, you can't tell from is that, that race? Is that racism? Oh, no, not from that statement. You can't tell whether or not he's racist. Okay, is that racism? No, I mean, he just, not, not based on those words. You can't really determine that. Okay, so here. So the person who wrote this has no, I don't think has any more information than we do, right? But here's the second paragraph. Frankly, the emboldened hate speech is exhausting. It's like, damn, no, it's hate speech. But I'm grateful some of these racists and ordinary non-racist citizens are being exposed. I have stopped counting the number of times I've argued with me that black Americans are just being paranoid or that a person can't be racist if he or she dates someone of a different race or the juvenile logic of someone cheers for food. Like, okay, it's like, wow, man. Now it's like emboldened racist. So this is where we take this thing. It becomes this little thing over here and it becomes this massive thing over here. And then what are we doing? Like how are we looking at it? How are we seeing it, right? Do you have a thought on that? Like I said before, it's controversy. It's all about the controversy. If they, if, if an article has something that's controversial, people are going to want to read it and buy it. So when they full out call him a racist, like people are going to read that. Okay, like, is he really a racist? I'm going to try to find out. So it, I, it's just, yeah, okay. Do you have a sorry. thought? Um, I personally think that the writer of this article, like, I don't know if they were going, like, they could have been going for, like, clicks and views and stuff like that, but I honestly think they just didn't even read into the full story to begin with, which as reported, No, they read the full story. Do. Oh, well, then they were totally going for clicks and views then. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, to, because the rest of it is clear that this person understood the story, right? Or at least, I don't know. But it's a take, right? Because some people would say, dude, you can't, you can't say the word, even you, my black friend, can't say the word ever. There are people who would say, no, you never say the word ever, ever, ever. That's just the bottom line. And some people would say, no, if you're white, you can't say the word. But me, I don't know. I'm, I, I, my DNA ancestry test shows that I'm 2% sub-Saharan African from the Ivory Coast, by the way. So can I whisper it? You know what I mean? <laughs> can I just say the end part? Like, can I, I just move my lips like what, what do I got like where is it right so it's a hard it's a tough call I don't know it's a it's a major thing so here's my take on it right I think that one of the unfortunate things about this kind of thing so again I'm not I'm not I'm not defending this guy at all right but I have to say that it's a little bit disconcerting sometimes. When I see stories like this, I'm always trying to peel back the layers. So someday, God, oh, please, knock on wood. If y'all read a story about Sam Richards, <laughs> might get fired because of X, Y, or Z. Let me just beg you. Actually, I don't give a shit. I, whatever. <laughs> I'll just go back to the Philippines. But look, read past the headline because there's probably something else going on. Unless you find out I got fired because back, you know, in, in 2015, uh, I read a quote that had the N-bomb in it, in which case you'll know why I got fired. <laughs> okay, so here's the deal. My take on this is that when we, when we take tiny things, 
But when we take stories like this and these become the stories, we're actually, one thing that's going on is we're really actually supporting white supremacy. And we're supporting the power structure because all we're doing is taking our, and we're, support, we're supporting rich people and poor people and all the things that are happening because we're taking our attention away from things that matter onto things that really, it's not, this doesn't matter. I mean, look, the, the guy said that, dropped the M-bomb in the context of talking about Colonel Sanders. It's not that it doesn't, it matters to something. But that's not the story that probably should be front page headlines and that we ought to be really up in arms about. In my humble opinion, right? Like, that's not the damn thing that I actually, if, the, if America wants to rise up, don't rise up on that. I got a lot of other things to rise up. Here, let me give you one. For example, right now, this just came out today that the United States is sl slamming the brakes. The UN um, has put this move on a ceasefire resolution in Yemen. How many of you know what's going on in Yemen? You don't know? Dude, so let me just give you a quick thing. Really? Fuck. Come on, man. This is one of the great... Yemen right now is one of the great human tragedies in the world. There's very little... There has not been a human tragedy that has been profoundly disturbing as this one, and it's happening right now. And the government of the United States just put its brakes on the possibility of doing something about it. And right now, by the end of the world, it's, or the end of the year, it's estimated 13 to 18 million Yemenis are at risk of starving to death. 13 to 18 million, my friends... 13 to 18 millions. And in a country of 28 million, because they're at war. And the war has been an absolute brutal war, waged by other states in the Middle East with, particularly Saudi Arabia and the Emirates, with weapons from the United States. In fact, Barack Obama supporters, if you don't like Trump and you wish we could go back to Barack Obama, Barack Obama sold $110 billion worth of weapons to the Saudis during his time. And those are the weapons that are being used on the Yemenis to commit these massacres. It's like, come on, man. And then the United States is going to step up to a peace price. This is peace. It's not, even just in Yemen. It's, it's not even Yemen. It's like all we could go to lots of places, right? But how about that? How about talk about that? Seriously, we're going to like not move toward peace here. See, how about this, man? Do you have your cell phone, bro? Do you know? Do you know about Coltan? You don't know about Coltan? Oh, my friend, you don't know about Coltan? No. Oh my God! All right. Do you know about Coltan? What do you know about slavery, dude? In the world today. Speaking of my I know a lot of it has to do with uh, human trafficking. There's, there's like different ways, and like um, especially like children and young women. There's like um, text messages going around where they have them go somewhere and they kidnap them, and that's all yeah. part of the slavery. Like, all right. What do you know about slavery? Like in the modern day? Yep. Oh yeah. Like you said, a lot of human trafficking. Like I think I like like heard a story of some woman who almost got human trafficked in a parking lot at a Walmart. And so it's like closer and scarier than we so think. So how many slaves are there in the world today? I have no clue. Millions. Uh, compared to in the past? I wouldn't even know where to start. Like, I think it's a lot worse now. I think it's a lot worse now. It's just like not talked about or not heard. Like it's all yeah. low key. How do you, how do you support slavery? Um, I guess Money. slavery takes many forms like nowadays and it depends on your definition of slavery. If you mean by like, like slavery when you like, are forced here let me give you a definition not not like i work at walmart and so i'm a slave because they won't pay me overtime it's like no you are forced to work for no pay and if you don't work it's fear of death or punishment coercion of some sort you are forced okay so bodily like, force so like you know like the people who like sew clothes in sweatshops they don't count as slaves no they do well some uh, of them yeah. do Yep. Okay, well then in that case, like, you know, like this jacket is from H&M. Like I buy clothing in like normal stores. So that of course contributes to like that system of slavery. Yep, okay. It, wait, so you're, you're admitting to, wait, hang on. <laughs> hey y'all, hang on. 
Your classmate, you're African-American, right? Yes. You trace your ancestry to slavery. Yes. So your classmate just said that she has clothes that are made by slaves. And you do, by the way, all through your wardrobe. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Do you know what your, what, do, what would your ancestors say about that? I honestly don't know. <laughs> I mean, they wouldn't look too favorably upon it, I would assume. I mean, what do you think, though? I mean, what do you, th do you think they... Um, I, like, I think they'd be like, oh, you know, like, why not buy clothes that are not made by slaves, or why not make your own clothes, but... Okay, like, okay, let me ask you that. Why, do you have your cell phone? Well, here I have mine. So how long do you think it would take me to find on my phone right here places in even in state college, but certainly back home for you, where you could buy clothing that's not made by slaves? How long do you think it would take me? Um, a little while, unless it's like someone who like makes clothes themselves. 30 seconds, maybe? Yeah, uh, well, it's the internet. Maybe like 15, 10. Okay, so... You could get on your phone, and you could get that information, and you don't. What do you think your ancestors would say to you? Who were slaves? I think they would say to just, you know, like, to get the, like, clothes that don't require slave labor to make. Dude, your family's from Sudan, and you're from North Sudan, dude. You know what's going on in South Sudan, my friend? You know how many people have died so. in South Sudan because of your people? I'm aware of that. Yeah, I'm not proud of it. None of us are really proud of what's going on down there. And, like, it's all part of the problem. Like, there's no one there's no one out there, like, taking that step out there. No one's out there taking that initiative. People are just watching. And that's part of the problem with that as well. Dude, okay, you're close. So you have clothes made by slaves, right? Okay. So, like, who's no one? Because you, all you got to do is get on your phone and figure out, Dude, does Tommy Hilfinger, where's, he, where's, where's this source? Like, where's the cotton from? Where, like, where's it all from? Like, you, what's it about? This right here, my friend, almost guaranteed is material with slave labor in it. Guaranteed. I don't think you're, you're lying. I believe you. But um, one of the things about that is that, um, like, how do I put this? The, the convenience of, like, nowadays, the convenience of buying certain things, that plays a big part in people. And also the fact that... Um, how do I put it? Dude, can, hang on. Just that, can we just perseverate on that word yeah. convenience? Right. I, I realize the two of you are really on the spot here, right? Because this is big. And convenience. So my ancestors, if we go back, because my ancestors were here. In, in, uh, I trace part of my father's lineage to, to Virginia. So uh, I grew up working class. My family had like six generations to not be working class. They fucking, they're still working class. They couldn't figure out how to not be poor. You know what I mean? But somebody back there might have been a slave owner. I don't know. Probably not because most people didn't own slaves. But like, it's convenience. My ancestors just said, well, it's convenience. I don't do it. I don't deal with this. I'm just like, y'all... More people talk about Papa John, have an opinion about Papa John that's wrong. Yeah, I mean, that's not wrong, but mo if when I ask people, what do you, oh, you dropped the M bomb, so you must have called someone the M bomb or whatever. It's like, okay, maybe not exactly that, but like, but when we talk about that, we're not talking about this. And there are more slaves in the world today than at any point in human history. By far and away, there are more slaves than there were slaves in the United States back at the peak of slavery. By far and away. Not even a question. And sl the life of slaves today is worse than it's ever been. Disposable people, very disposable. So it's nothing. You know, back in the United States, th nah, I'm not going to go into that, okay? So look. So the question is, convenience, mm -hmm. that, okay, it's all convenient. How many, how many people in the classroom seriously take the time to buy clothing that you know is not made in sweatshops and not made, that doesn't have any slave labor in it? How many people in the classroom do that? 
one. If there was one person I would have picked out, it probably would have been you, by the way. Wait, hang on. I can't say that it hasn't been produced in slave labor, but I can say that it's more sustainable. More sustainable. It's okay. It's been thrifted. Okay, so you donated make it. clothes. And so ahead. it's a little bit more sustainable because you're not contributing to fast fashion. Like she, I'm really happy that she was brave enough to admit that. It's a big thing. So thank yeah. you. No, it's big. Yeah. So here. So Colton, by the way, your cell phone has slave labor and it's some of the most yeah. egregious labor. So there we have it in the Congo. So that's not, you know, it's north, it's south of where your peeps are from. But like, dudes, this is like Colton, everybody, you have a cell phone, it has slave labor in it. You have a, you have clothing at home, it has slave labor in it. It's like, where are we, yo, hang on a second. Damn dogs. Wait, hang on. Can, you see what I deal with? You see this? This is what it's like to be me. You know what I mean? <laughs> Shit. No wonder I go home and do shots of Jigger. <laughs> Listen, hang on a second. Hey, yo, hang on. Shh. Hang on. Seriously, I'm, I'm, I actually don't want to make a joke. So here, I just want to go to, this is, I think, a really serious issue. Because what happens is we get caught sometimes in the conversations that just suck us in. It's like it pulls us in and we can't nod. And suddenly I'm talking about pizza and the NFL and so on. And meanwhile, I'm not paying attention to this. And I'm not paying attention to this. And I'm not paying attention to other things that I really could pay attention to. But if I do, I have to look at myself instead of pointing fingers at somebody like, at somebody like this guy, John Schneider guy or whatever his last name is. And then I don't really know and then that's what it is. So do you have a final word? Do you have a final word? You get the final word today. I don't know. I don't have anything. You don't have, do you have a final word? Not really. Okay. All right, you don't have to have fun. Hey, thanks for, bye, yo, hang on.